Okay. Um, this closes off our, uh, our look at the Shaping book. And uh, powerful book, I think. Now, uh, and, and the, the sign of how great these thinkers are, you know, uh, those of you who are interested in graduate school, this is the kind of world to go into, is the, where the big ideas are being really worked out in big ways by very bright people. And man, they, they just have such qualifications. Now, I've given you a video to listen to about mathematics by Ian Hacking. Ian Hacking is, I think, an amazing scholar. As uh, I, I'm primarily dealt with stuff he's written on probabilities, but and certainty and stuff. But the uh, um, he he talks about mathematics in that and mathematics and you know he, uh, just watch it. Uh, I don't understand it fully. You won't understand it fully. It's it's got a lot of depth to it, but. But just to know that these are the kinds of things seriously talked about at UC Berkeley for this. So, uh, watch that. And then uh, here, let's look at this. The, uh, this what is knowledge for, in this last section here. Um, 17th century mechanical philosophers attempted to discipline, if not all cases, eliminate teleological accounts of the natural world. Yet, as ordinary actors, they accepted the propriety of a teleological framework. What they mean by this, what's being meant by this is that, you know, what is knowledge for? What is knowledge for? A lot of people are going to use it. Uh, the knowledge isn't just for knowledge's sake to sit out there. And so the two people, two institutions that he talks about using it are the state. And we will carry this on because the state state is going to use it, especially while you have state education and state supportive universities, and we'll carry that on, especially into the founding of the German universities, University of Berlin and such, but then also religion is going to use it. And so, see, he does not, in this, and what's really good in here is you don't see this as a, uh, the uh, sort of scientist versus the state, or science used by the state, you don't see it as science versus religion or science used by religion. Uh, he wants to see the 17th century people as really sort of a, a very independent bunch. And they've got places like the Royal Society, which are these independent places where, the, so there's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very interesting chapter. He starts out with Francis Bacon and goes in, but there's not science, just this sort of an independent body of knowledge floating around out there. And so uh, I'd like to point out, um, just uh, uh, yeah, after he talks about the, you know this, you know these organizations and such, is um, is with uh, the science and religion section. Just this Galileo story that gets retold and retold and retold throughout history, where scientists sort of pat, pat themselves on the back. That's the, that is the same kind of thing which I gave you to read from Jeff Russell about the flat Earth. There's these stories people tell that are not true. They're basically for us in the you know, modern university because we are a very distinctly structured sociological system of knowledge that needs to find funding and support itself. We do a lot of things to pat ourselves on the back. We don't want to hear the truth. We want to just you know, keep at it. Okay, so that Galileo story, he does a real nice job here. Uh, like, this is a nice line here. Uh, you know, for example, Galileo's advocacy of the Copernicanism as a physically true account of the cosmos was applauded by some quarters of the Catholic Church. A lot of quarters of this Catholic Church. Catholic Church is no one entity. And so to say that the Church opposed Galileo, you know, this is just, this is just story time. Also, he goes into it with this is the is that Boyle especially is a good example of this, but there's a Newton too, or they're not attacking the church. They're not trying to undermine the, the religion in any, any sort of fundamental ways. You know, uh, you know, Newton's not a Trinitarian. That's, you know, his business. There's, everybody's fighting about things like, what's the meaning of a miracle? How, does, how do miracles work? A correct natural philosophy accordingly allows scope for God's intermittent exercise of divine will in the world, as well as encouraging recognition of creative wisdom. You know, this is, this is the sort of stuff that's 
allowing for, but you know, the mechanical universe is mechanical. Boethius said this. Go back and look at Boethius. Boethius has a mechanical universe. There's this great machine that God's created, but then there's this wheel of fortune within it, and then there's other things, you know. It's a complex world. And then uh, he talks about Newton here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, Newton here professed contentment with the ultimate inscrutability of nature. The demand for intelligibility had to be taught its proper limits. Now, we saw that, that uh, in the last chapter, we like Boyle was kept these limits maybe stronger. Newton went into this mathematical idealism and stuff. But natural philosophy has to be a solid rock of certainty laughed on all sides by the seas of mystery. That's their pursuit, their pursuit of certainty and the questions of how to do that, you know, and the, and the methods never get stabilized completely. Is this the certainty mathematics? Is the certainty experiment? Things like that. But those go on. And then this, uh, to make it, this is the last pages here, is, is that fundamentally, you see, the issue is, uh, is this objectivity and subjectivity. As long as science is considered somehow objective, you know, science is objective, and the uh, rest of the world, morality, history, and things like that, we're all subjective. Then there's a type of rhetoric which is uh, useful to the sciences and for the state and for religion. And people can, people want to grab hold of sciences on our side against those guys. We somehow are stronger because we're the objective ones. See, this is the this is a sort of polemicism in which science gets dragged into. And so, got to watch out for that. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, here's this, yeah, talking about the new languages here. Uh, now, this is, this, is, this is the last page, okay? And this is what my hope for you, and certainly, you know, this is why I read books like this. And I have some hope that at least a few readers, that's us, will think differently about science and society now than they did at the beginning of this book. Is This book is not simply some sort of factoid thing. It is to help us understand that the 17th century had a lot of wisdom, which we have sort of like messed around with, and, and that uh, fundamentally, uh, it would be good for us in many ways to understand the scientific revolution better. <laughs> Going back to the first sentence of the book, to understand that the scientific revolution isn't a thing. It's not a revolution necessarily, and it's not scientific in any sort of simple, boxy, objective sense. This, in my view, would be the most, more, uh, most unfortunate, inaccurate uh, conclusion. Something is being criticized here. Uh, here he's talking about he does not want this book. We do not want to criticize science. Science is great. History is great. Literature is great. Philosophy is great. Math is great. But we don't want to use stories tend to be told about the sciences, tend to be told about the fight between sciences and humanities, tend to tend to create, and so that in the polemics of like grant chasing in the modern world and all sorts of other things, uh, we don't have any sort of pursuit of truth in some sort of pure, airy-fairy way. And so, so the thing is, let's, let's watch out for the stories that are told. Galileo was oppressed by the church, or the, you know, people believed in a flat earth before you know, Columbus came around. Things like this. These are the stories people tell about European intellectual history when we want to actually, as European intellectual history class, understand as best we can more what's true. We, all of us are telling stories to some extent. None of us is, none of us is objective. But on the other hand, it's, it's we can do better. And hopefully in a college classroom where uh, hopefully someday we could actually sit together and talk, we would be in a situation of, um, we, could, we can, could be more peaceful, more hopeful, more, uh, more able 
to, to, to see the intellectual world in what, for what it is and can be rather than sort of a, a, what people want it to be in the, and as a rhetorical tool and polemical tool. So, Stephen Chapin, good book, and we're going to continue on and uh, move into uh, further into the Enlightenment, further into some mathematical stuff, and then on into the uh, creation of universities in uh, Germany.